there, folks. I'm Emily. And I'm Elk. And we had a little bit of an interesting situation this morning because we had a mouse in the basement, but it was on our little tape line that we currently have in the middle of the basement because we're still working on our bookshelf wall. And the problem was it was so dead center and we didn't know whose problem it was to deal with. So end result, the mouse is still just sitting there. Okay, it has to be Emily's problem because there's no way a mouse got through any of my defenses on my side of the basement. Even the overall basement, a mouse should not have gotten through, but definitely not on my side of the basement. That is using logic and facts to present the argument. Versus Emily just saying, mice are ew. Okay, but here's the thing though. Mice are ew. See? And then she tried singing to like Cinderella and then it didn't re- respond to that either. Which I don't understand because it should. So Because I'm a yeah. princess. That's why we're at the impasse right now. Yeah. Speaking of princesses also, though, <laughs> there's oh one princess goodness. from all the Disney princesses that I'll concede that if Emily ever had to fill in for that princess... Oh, no, this is the wrong one. It's the wrong one? I was say, is Belle or is it Snow White? Oh. I'll take either. So Not because you. she actually looks like a princess, uh, but she has the right hair color, t- I think. I think that's true. <laughs> right now it's a little bit longer, so it's probably more like Belle, but sometimes I do have it shorter like Snow White, so I guess it depends upon how long my hair is. And also, I guess a little bit more towards Belle since I sank to that mouse and it didn't come. To me, so obviously I don't have that. <laughs> yeah, the animal, animal touch <laughs> trait. So, but that's fine because today we are going to talk about Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast. Which, just a little side note, isn't it so interesting? That song is like so in the public conscious, and it's weird to think that it's only twenty nine years old. Yeah, that is kind of crazy. Like, imagine the first people. I always think about like the first people who heard. Um, Everything's Coming Up Roses, you know, or Tradition, or some of these great, like, when they went to see the show, they didn't know the song, but now those songs, everyone knows. And I just find that really interesting. Anyway, so talking about Beauty and the Beast, we're going to try to talk about all three iterations. The original Disney animated version from 1991, then the musical, which I think debuted on Broadway in 94, and then the live action, which came out in 2017, starring Emma Watson. Um, overall, violence is a two because there are, there's like fighting at the end between the objects and the humans. And even though it's cartoony, it is still fighting. Also Gaston, who's the villain, stabs the beast. So that's violent. Uh, Oh, language is a zero. (laughs) Oh yeah. And he's thrown off a building. So it's, it's, it's still cartoony violence, but it's still violent. Um. Oh, and they're also wolves. And I do know a lot of, like, little kids who find parts of this movie scary because of some of those things. So maybe not, like, for the little, little ones to watch. Uh, Language is a zero, though, as it should be, because it's for kids. And romance is one and a half, because it is a love story, but it's not, like... We gave it a li- We put it at a, a half, or we put it one and a half because it's the romance is what a lot of the story is about. But in terms of the level of intimacy or how explicit anything is, it's just a one because, you know, there's a kiss and they have their romantic evening and... Lumiere is a flirt. (laughs) Oh, and Lumiere is a flirt. Lumiere is definitely a flirt. And a little bit more obvious in the stage version and I think in the live action version. Yeah, in the people version. Yeah. 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 So, it's a, but it's still 1.5. It's, it's nothing really inappropriate. It's about what, I mean, people do have romance. It's not like it's a thing that doesn't exist in the world and it's a thing that kids have to be totally sheltered from. So when it's in context and in a way that's appropriate for kids, then we let you know that it exists, but not really anything to clutch your pearls over. We should mention, by the way, back to the violence, it's also because Maurice gets locked up with Original by the yeah. Beast, but also he gets locked up again when they try to say that he's crazy, and then if everybody remembers the fun fact that Emily shared by by the Hunchback of Notre Dame, when we spoke about the Hunchback, would you like to reshare yeah. that fun fact? Because I, 
Yes. So the villain in, well, there's several villains in Beauty and the Beast, but the guy who runs the um, insane asylum, I guess, yeah. insane asylum in Beauty and the Beast, um, his name is not coming to me right now. Anyway, is voiced by the same guy who voiced Frollo and Hunchback of Notre Dame. And the reason he voiced Frollo and Hunchback of Notre Dame is because when he did the part in Beauty and the Beast, the Disney executives were like, that guy has a villain voice and we need him again because he is, and he does. His voice is so villainous. And we were so glad that they did that again. And yes. another parallel between Beauty and the Beast and Hunchback is that if you listen in the animated version to the Hunchback, the opening song, and especially if you hear about who is the, like, who is the monster oh. and who is the man, that end thing, the person who's the jester, right? The person who's playing the story hits an insane key. You have to listen to it because it's not so obvious. Oh, that's but amazing. I don't know how he hits that key because they don't have an estate, which we love the stage version of it, but they don't hit that key there. That guy hits that key. And it's not like an opera kind of, I don't know how, he just hits it. And the Beauty and the Beast in the, in the animated version, if you listen to the music of the prologue, some people are like, that is, they just love that music of the prologue. So that's the parallel. Mm. Opening songs. <laughs> uh, they don't have I it in the stage version. Gonna... Like they don't, I don't think they have it in the stage version. I don't remember if it's in the mm. live action, but there's that, there's a beautiful, um, piano in the opening of the animation. Just when they first start I like narrating. I was going the story. to say that in, um, the opening song of Hunchback of, Notre Dame when they're going through the town of France you can see Belle walking with her book uh, through yes. Paris yes and that's actually one thing about the musical also that opening song of the Bonjour the good day on stage oh, yeah. it actually worked out it was it was pretty cute the way they did it on stage because they have this kind of like two-sided houses that they're turning around like a lot of mood whatever but I thought the staging of it was pretty good they actually the musical staging I thought there was there wasn't anything that, that, that I didn't specifically not like about it. Like more of my likes or dislikes are either from the live action, what they did in the live action. But as far as, you know, how do you like the animation and the musical kind of feel, the, sort of feel the same about both, even though not all the music's mm -hmm. the same. Um, right. the live action is really where it's kind of like, come on people <laughs> for different yeah. reasons. But yeah. Which is. Which is why we decided to talk about it, because we assume, and maybe wrongly, but we assume that most people listening have probably seen the animated version of Beauty and the Beast. But Disney has done all of these live action remakes recently, and they really vary in success and our recommendations. And it's not about being faith. A lot of them are pretty faithful to the, to the originals. But the question is, if you are making, if you're, Doing a remake, there should be a reason. And for most of these, there doesn't seem to be a reason other than we want to put live action, we want to do it live action, and we want... We want more money. money. And I, I don't have a problem with companies making money. That's what companies are, should be doing. But when it's something so beloved as so many of these movies are, and they don't always seem to take the kind of care with it, um, or have the same... So there's one adaptation I really liked and we will probably have to talk about because I really enjoyed the live action Cinderella. I thought that one oh. was really good, but all of the rest and still felt like Disney, but all the rest of these live actions, they just seem so dark. I stopped and watching one of the them, thing, especially after this one. I just, I don't care about them. I've seen, so I saw Cinderella, I saw Beauty and the Beast, I saw Jungle Book. And I saw Aladdin, and I saw Maleficent, which isn't really a remake, but it's kind of a remake. And I saw Alice in Wonderland, though those are already a few years ago. Um, those are all the ones. I haven't seen Mulan. I didn't, um, see, I didn't see Aladdin either, because it was just like, whatever. They just... The thing with these live act... So when, when people think of these Disney movies... One of the biggest things that people think of is the music and the songs. And a lot of the Aladdin had more songs, but Cinderella was missing a lot of the music. I think yeah. Beauty and the Beast had some of the songs, but not all of them. You should have taken out half the songs from the... Uh... Sorry, Kate, one second. I know, especially for Harry Potter fans like Emily or if other people um, out there carry the same... sick. Well, if, I don't recall. If other people out there have the same thing about Harry Potter, Emma Watson cannot sing. 
Sorry. No. Just carrying a tune and being like a good singer are not the same thing. And from the first song, it was just like, why was she cast as Belle? And why did she sign to be cast as Belle? Does she think she can sing? I don't really want to or- bash her, but it's like... You made that decision too. <laughs> you agreed right. to the decision. The or even in it's very common. It used to be common in a lot of movie musicals and even Disney movies. The voice actor was not always the same as the singer. Right, like Mulan. I so think. they could have yeah. right Mulan and Pocahontas because I think actually Leia Salonga did Pocahontas's voice and Mulan's voice. Oh. Um. I think, I can't remember. I think Paige O'Hara, oh no, Judy Kuhn was the singing voice for Pocahontas. She actually was, she's a Broadway lady. Anyway, you can have Emma Watson. I get Emma Watson in this role. She makes sense to me in this role. But just have someone else sing. It's, I don't think there's any shame. It's just get some somebody people, who can sing. It's like what we were saying with some, La La Land. Just, there's enough people who kids right. like Dan Stevens who plays the Beast. He can sing, I mean, whether or not you like him or don't like, he could sing. I didn't feel I wasn't cringing when he was singing, but Emma Watson right. was like, "Why are you singing right now? You're not a singer." Yeah. And there are so many people who are singers. Find the singers. I mean, I'd be oh, we'd love to work with Emma Watson, whatever. You know, I can't argue with that. Um, right. But you're not a singer. Don't. Why are you doing this? Especially it's not because it's yeah. supposed to be comical. Like, if you're not a singer, you're pulling off the part because it's comical, fine. <laughs> but it's not supposed to be right. comical. And we got to sit through you singing all this music. So iconic songs and being yeah. a character that people love. And I guess I just come back to, I don't understand the purpose of these live actions. For a while, Disney was re-releasing some of their movies in 3D. Right. And that made sense to me because you want to introduce it to a new audience you know, it's, and people want, like, people want to bring their kids to see these movies in theaters because it's the movies they grew up with. So re-releasing them or updating them, you know, in 3D, that totally makes sense to me. But just remaking them and you take away, or they, they seem to have taken away what makes it Disney, which is the music and the lightness. You still, there is so much to learn in the original animated, and we should probably talk about some of the good messages that it sends, but they're just so dark, some of the live action, and I I don't like them. Well, they also, they changed some of the music. I don't know why they needed different songs in the live action. The musical has different music than the animation, which, you know, sometimes I guess when you're adapting to stage, they might have felt like the Beast needed a song because it's not really told from his POV. I mean, it is and it isn't, so maybe they felt he needed some songs. Um, and just another thing, by the way, about the live action, Josh Gad is really annoying as LeFou. I know I everyone get was Josh like, Gad, period. oh, they really like him. So, you know, you know, you like him, you don't like him, whatever. But the LeFou character was so annoying in the, in the live action. And that's not even people were getting all worked up at the end where there's a quote unquote, like the gay moment because the way he looks at the guy that you could tell that like, oh, they're hitting on each other. But it's like. The character of LeFou was, I don't know, he was just really annoying in, in the, mm-hmm. there were just a lot of times he was there when he shouldn't have been and saying stuff that it's like, why are you talking right now? I just, I did not like the character at all. Um, and, the, and the animation, and even in the musical, like, he's not anything, he's just a sidekick. Whatever, if you, you know, whatever you feel about him, he's just, he just, but in the, in the film, it felt like they were like trying to like push him front and it's like, stop it, you're just, he was, it was just a really annoying character. But here's the important thing. Emily wants to make a defense for why Beauty Falling in Love with the Beast is not Stockholm Syndrome. So. Yes. Because if everybody knows, Belle switches place with her dad. Basically, her dad stumbles across the, the castle because it's a stormy night and the Beast locks him up because he's the Beast, among other reasons, okay? And um, Belle comes to switch place with her father, right? So the Beast locks Belle up. And then eventually, you know, he gives her the run of the castle, kind of. And they do fall in love with each other. So a lot of people are like, oh, it's Stockholm Syndrome because it's captor. It's the captive falling in love with the captor. But Emily does not right. believe that's so. Well, and I, I remember seeing those posts all the time on like Tumblr and whatever people saying, oh, it, Beating the Beast is just Stockholm Syndrome, which I think is just people. Okay, first of all, people, this is a fairy tale. 
Originally, it was just a fairy tale. It's about a human who gets turned into a beast by magic, and there's a rose that determines his fate. So maybe we don't need to look into it so deeply, and we can just accept that he's a beast, and then she's good, and she changes him, and they fall in love. And also, by the way, people are turned into teacups and candelabras, so can we not look too deeply into it? But if people are going to look deeply into it and call it... That's what we do. Uh, Stockholm Syndrome, then I'm going to argue with them. So I, I was reading up on what Stockholm Syndrome is, and the reason, and I, I mean, it's a long article. Maybe we should post it to our Instagram so people can read it. But the basic reason why Bell, why this is not Stockholm Syndrome, there's seven parts. I'm going to just list them off quickly. First of all, Bell chooses to be there. She wasn't captured. She chooses to be in that position. That's number one. Number two, Belle is not with the beast all the time. Like it's usually in Stockholm Syndrome, it's like the captor is trying to create a relationship with his captive, but the beast is pretty much like, don't go to the West Wing and uh, leave me alone. Like he doesn't want to have anything to do with her. He didn't really want to keep her captive. He probably didn't even want to keep her father captive either. He just did. But by the way, he was turned into the beast when he was like 13 and uh, he apparently has no parents so we don't really know how to deal with people <laughs> so you can't really blame the beast for being how awful he was um bell doesn't change her mind of her situ first of all she's i guess okay stockholm syndrome usually develops out of a hostage's desperation to survive she's not desperate to survive and she also doesn't change her attitude about the situation. It's not like she slowly says, oh, I want to be here. Remember, she tries to leave, and she eventually does leave. She gets on her horse, and she escapes. She goes back to her father. Well, tries to rescue right, her Right, she's father, trying to... Yeah. Yes. She ends up coming... So the first time she escapes, she gets stopped by the wolves, and then right. the beast saves her, and then she elects to come back because she wants to take care of the beast. But that's an active choice on her part because she's seen a change in him, that she wants to take care of him. And then she literally sings about a changing change in him, right? There's something sweet and almost kind, yeah. but he was mean and he was coarse, but she's finding something positive in him. And that's actually... And then it, that actually goes back to the original fairy tale, has that, that even though it was a beast, that, that you know... The, the bell or beauty does see that there was a kindness about him, which is the impetus for his change also. That right. I believe that's in the which is, original fairy tale. Cause I had to look it up plug for the book for the uh, fairy tale rewrite that I wrote called uh, human again by E.L. Tenenbaum. Look it up, buy it. So yes, there is, that was always there. I think that there was a kindness there. It just gets covered over in his beastness. And then bell kind of uncovers that kindness. So it's not like, Oh, She's not reinterpreting something that's not kindness. She's she's rediscovering that kindness in him kind of thing, which is also an important yeah. distinction, probably. Yeah. Well, it is, and I'll come back to that at the end. Just the last few points. So, again, Belle, when she finally can leave, when the beast lets her go, she goes because she needs to go take care of her father. Um, when she does come back, it's not because she... She knows the beast is going to be murdered. So she's coming back to prevent murder. It's not like she's coming back because she... Look, I can't be a weak. It's like... Yeah. Exactly. That, is, that is there also, but yes. yes. He's but it's danger. also he's going to be murdered. Yeah. And then apparently the biggest thing about Stockholm Syndrome is that she doesn't have... I guess a stock, someone who's really a victim of Stockholm Syndrome would have a negative view of their rescuers because they've so identified with the captors. But Belle doesn't have rescuers. No one comes to save her. She has to save herself. And the people who come to rescue yeah, are a mob, which yeah. include Gaston and LeFou, who are trying to kill the beast. So number one, it's, if you look at what Stockholm Syndrome is, it's not. But number two, if you say, oh, she's just a victim of Stockholm Syndrome, then you completely negate the point of the story, which is she is a good person with a good heart and she was able to see the goodness in this beast and help him be a better person. Because the point of the story is that he was a beast and he was apparently as a 13 year old, very unpleasant, which by the way, do you know any 13 year olds who are super pleasant? <laughs> um, but she sees something good in him and helps him become a better person. And if we can't let people help other people be better 
people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, like, then what's the point? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's actually really important that the that we don't think of it as Stockholm syndrome, but that we think of it as he changes for her. She never really changes. Well, right? She, I mean, she does a little bit. She like, falls in love like with he, him. What she's forgiving, I want to say forgiving about him, is that he has like a cruelness to him, but we don't see him. We never see him beat someone up or murder anyone or anything like that also. So it's also very different. You know, that right. there, I think there's a different argument there that it's just like, oh, he was very selfish and he was very selfish and what he did was bad. But then he gets cursed to be a beast and just as a beast, he just rages and he destroys things, whatever. But we never see him actually beat. I mean, he keeps people around him kind of miserable, but we don't see him. We never see any of the servants trying to leave. Well, because they're all cursed, I guess. But it's not like any of the servants are trying to leave and he, and he brings them back. I guess they're all kind of bound right. to the castle. So they were all kind of part of this curse. But we don't see him actively. Okay, he locks up Maurice. But we don't see him actively but like, he's not... harming someone. Like not as much as we see someone. Gaston harming people. Gaston is much more clearly like villain a in that bad. Regard. Yeah, yeah, he's the true villain. Yeah, the beast just wants to be left alone. Not... Kind of, it's just uh, leave me right. to my darkness sort of thing. Versus Gaston is much more of a bully, you know, trying to take like, no, we're gonna marry Belle, and like, you know, whether she likes it or not, I don't care what you like or not, kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It tying it back again to Hunchback. It is sort of a similar who was the monster and who was the man yeah. because. The beast is technically the monster and Gaston is technically the man. But other than the beast being unpleasant. And yes, he locks up Maurice and that's not forgivable. But Gaston is ready also to lock up Maurice. Yeah, for much worse Based reasons. on even less. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for, he wants like force. He like wants to blackmail Belle into marrying him and he goes to murder the beast there's really no reason for him to murder the beast, except that Belle's fallen in love with him, but the beast hasn't actually done anything to Gaston. Right. They just make him a bigger villain also. Like, oh no, we can't have a beast, a beast, a beast. Even though he's never right. done anything to the, to the village also. Right. He's just sort of left the town. Like, no one seems to even be bought, right? Like, he has to tell them, oh, there's this beast that's been living in this castle for at least seven years yeah, or something like yeah. that. And no one... But no one's cared for the last seven years. So clearly the beast hasn't really done anything problematic. Yeah. I mean, besides for being selfish, which is a person, it's, it's on him. It's something so to work on. Yeah. It. yeah. Right. It's def it's not a good character trait, but it's not evil. It's a. Uh, it's evil. But it's anyway. doesn't, it doesn't, it's not evil onto others. So yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting. See, cutting through the haze. This is what we do. <laughs> That is what we do. As mentioned before. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if you haven't seen the animated version, what are you doing with your life? Yeah. And Belle loves See books. See the animated version. Belle loves books. So, hmm? you know, yeah. <gasps> yeah. So we, we actually both identify with her as princesses. Well, at least just like that regard. Yeah. <laughs> right. Elt is not really princessy because, um, what did you say about flounces and petticoats devil's wear is that what you called them no i think that was just the, the that was the abbreviated version of what i called them i had a oh, longer okay. just more descriptive term for them but yeah gotcha. and ribbons and, and ruffles all the things they all go together gotcha yeah oh my goodness okay the mouse just moved i'm gonna break out my ruler because i think it is now technically closer to out which means it is out's problem to deal with so i'm going to sign off and we're going to treat it humanely, by the way. There's no, like, killing the mouse here. We're just trying to figure out who has to be the one to take it outside. And I think it's Elt. So, I'm going to go use my logic and my facts to dispute the argument. To dispute the ruler. Well, <laughs> fine. I'm going to Disney princess it onto your side. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. Catch you next time. Oh My Word podcast is brought to you by the Pearl Clutching Basement Dwellers at Oh My Word. Follow us on Instagram for updates at Oh My Word Podcast or like and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For full episode notes and detail, visit eltenabaum.com. Music is by Tim Burke. Sound is by Gabriel Yaffe. See you next time. Mm -hmm.